Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Good singing. It's been worth being here. Hadn't it been a blessing just to be here and sing? It has been a great blessing. Man, I have been treated to a parish delicacy tonight. I got to eat over at Prater's Taters. I didn't try one of those taters. I can't believe you put all that on the tater. Man, I'm just glad you live in a place that you can say tater. That's a good thing, isn't it? I, I, I wonder what they would say. Boy, if I was somewhere up there, you know. I, I, somebody said, I was in New York, and I may have told this yesterday, but I told it to somebody, I'm sure. I was in New York, and I was talking. And they called down, a little girl was helping, called the other people down. And they said, say something. And I said, oh, ma'am, what would you like for me to say? And they was all giggling and everything. And they got their heads together, and then they said, where are you from? I said, Michigan. <laughs> and they just looked at me. I said, southern Michigan. <laughs> and they said, Tennessee. Now I said, fine, I said, Tennessee. And they said, we knew it's Tennessee or Georgia one, you know. And I, they were laughing at me. So I got to eat some taters. I, I, I didn't. I ate just a little bit. Now, now it was good. I ate a Reuben sandwich. I, I, that was a great Reuben sandwich. It was either that or the fact that I was with LaVale Patsy that made it special, uh, and I appreciate that so much. Uh, just the company makes that special, you know. And, uh, but I did. I enjoyed it. But, but now I found out that they've opened, a, that y'all are a chain now. Prater's Taters is a chain. That's a good thing. And now you got one in, in Parsons. Well, I, I think that's really good that you're moving up to more metropolitan, more more. Con you know, a more refined group of people over here in Parsons. Man, if you'll get one in Waynesboro, we are so refined in Waynesboro that we would do that. We, we, the only thing is that I don't know, if you come to Waynesboro, you probably have to fry them. I don't know if you can, uh, I don't know if we do baked potatoes much in Waynesboro. We do, we do a lot of fried potatoes. Boy, I'm so honored to be with you. What a great blessing. A great blessing is for me. I've already gotten more from you, just like I did in the times I have been here before. I've already gotten way more from you than you'll ever get from me. But what a great joy it is to be here. Hope that you all have your DVR set and you can go home, watch North Carolina and Villanova after we get done here. Know that that's going on. Appreciate you braving that, that, that thought of staying there. Man, you young people, y'all got it made, man, DVRs. There ain't no boy, we used to have VCRs. That's how, you, that's how you recorded a game when you were gone. You going to church, you recorded VCR. I never could set ours at the right time. You know what I mean? I never could get it at the right time or at the right channel. And I can remember sometimes I would set it. Y'all remember when those first came out? You know, they looked like suitcases. They were about like them cameras. You know, kids walk around now, they video. And, man, you know, I worry about that. I teach school. And I think I'm going to end up on YouTube at any moment. I, I really do worry about that. I'm looking at it. I turn around every now and then like them kids. I say, hey, look, when I turn my back, don't y'all don't video me and put me on YouTube. I'm not having that. I don't want you to do it. But used to, you know, man, you had a camera... It doubled as a weapon. You could hold it up here. You remember those video cameras? And if somebody ran up to you, you didn't have to film them. You just hit them with a the camera. It'd knock them out. That's VCRs. You should be big. Like, oh, you had a big old VCR. And I would set it. You know, that was really trouble for us because you ran your, you know, you ran your, uh, 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 out, you ran your cable cord to the back of the VCR, and then you ran it out of the VCR up to your TV, and then you had to put it on channel three or something. And sometimes when you would set it, I would mess it up and it would get off channel three and my daddy couldn't change stations. You know, we could only see one of the six stations that we got at that point in time. We were so excited, you know, to get six or seven stations. And then, you know, TV, we couldn't change it for a month. We'd all just look at each other, I don't know. They said, it happened since you tried to video, since you tried to tape that ball game. And I said, well, I did. I mean, but now you just DVR it. That's a lot easier. I can, I can DVR it. That, that, that's good. And we're, we're, I guess Cassandra and Kate are probably doing for that for me. I, I hope they would be here. But they, uh, they moved their baseball game, so he, he got, had to work out football today, but I, I think he's going to have an off day tomorrow. So, boy, I hope he'll be here. You'll see he's, he's, he's quite the specimen. Uh, uh, no, he's, well, he's mine. But I love that rascal, I'll just tell you. And, uh, but I hope, I hope that those two will be here with me tomorrow. It's great to see you. Great to have some visiting all the way from Wayne County. Good to have that. Good to have all of you. Uh, to be here with us. God, who at sundry times and divers' manners spake unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us by his Son. That's where we started from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And what we decided when we started about that, we talked about the authority of the Son, talked about what the Son said. 
that, you know, he said, now look, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send the Spirit of truth, and he will guide you in all truth, John 16 and 13. And when you begin thinking about that, what we said was there's never been a time when God has not spoken unto man. We know that he spoke directly to Adam, we said. We know he spoke directly to Noah. He spoke directly to Abraham. We also said then there's been time after that. He spoke to Israel through Moses. He spoke to Israel through Isaiah. He spoke to Nineveh through Jonah, right? And we said in the last days has spoken to us by a son who promised us the Holy Spirit would come and who would guide our apostles into all truth. And then all these men wrote as the Spirit gave them what? Utterance. Right? It's all, all right there in the Scripture. All Scripture is given then by inspiration. And we know the prophet of that, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So what we had to decide was whether or not that meant anything. You know, sometimes people have rules that don't mean anything. You ever seen that? You ever seen a grandparent when the kids come in their house? You know, used to, when you came in Terrell Cruz's, Connie Cruz's house, don't run in the house meant don't run in the house. You run across there once and pow, you stop. You know what I'm saying, Corey? That was it. My kid, he just runs in that house anytime he wants to. They said, look at him. He's, he, boy, he's fine. I don't, know how you, I don't know how we got something that good out of you, boy. And then and, and he just run through there. That rule's meaningless now. So what we had to decide is, did what Christ say, is it meaningless to us? What we decided was, it's not. We said that if we sin, then we're amenable to what Christ has said. We said, if the great commission to preach everywhere Matthew 28 and 18, beginning at Jerusalem, Luke 24, 46 and 47, to every creature, Mark 16, 15 and 16, to the uttermost, Acts 1 and 8. If that's true, then we're amenable. We said, we said if, if, if Christ really is how Paul described him, if that's his nature of 1 Timothy 6 and 15, that he is king of king, lord of lords, that he is the one great potentate. That all authority is given unto him. And if we went ahead moments ago and read Hebrews 1 and 3, you know, who is the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, who uh, all things are upheld by the, by the word of his power, and, 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 and that when he had by himself purged us from our sins, is now set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. If that's where he is, then we're amenable. We said that if that's the word, John 12 and 48, that's going to judge us. The words of men will pass away, but the words of Christ shall never pass away. We said if we are going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, if that's true, then we're amenable. It does matter. It's a rule of living and a guide for living then that, that has to mean something. So we talked about that, didn't we? We talked about it in class, and then we decided, where, where are we running to? You know, we talked about life being a race. We, we even use Hebrews 12 and 1, seeing wherefore also we are compassed about with so great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight, and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, you know, we said of our faith. So we talked about Jonah running from God, Jonah running to God, Jonah running with God, and then Jonah running ahead of God. And then we talked about in the midst then of our human race, and as we are running and as we are going rapid, and as we go to bed one night, like I said, and we're 40, and we wake up and we're 52, we have a place to run to. We studied in Genesis 26 about Isaac going along and building Wales and going down the valley of Gerar and coming to a place called Rehoboth. The Lord has made a place for us. We said God has made a place for us. In his heart of love, he loves us. John 3, 16, 17. In the atoning blood of Jesus, Christ tasted death for every man. Hebrews 2, 7. In the church, it's the fullness of him that filleth all in all, which he is the head Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. In heaven, John 14, where there's many mansions that have been prepared. We said God has made a place for us. Now I'm going to tell you why you need to get to that place. We talked to you last night about running. 
and running and now knowing God has had a place for you. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen when you get there. When you find your place, I want you to know what's going to happen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 15. We're going to study a little bit from the, that gospel according to Luke. Right now I know what you're thinking. We know what Luke 15 is. Luke 15, that's, that's, that's the parables of the lost. And it really is. That's, that's, that's what it is. And we see that and we get into studying that just a little bit. You know, we talk as it begins there in the very beginning and Christ speaking to them under parables. And, you know, he tells them what? About a shepherd that has a sheep and has a hundred sheep and one of them's lost. And he says what? He's going to leave the ninety and nine and do what? Go find the one sheep. And when he does, he says what? He's going to come and he's going to be carrying that sheep like you would carry a child. And, and there's going to be what? Great rejoicing. It's going to be great celebration because of what? Because he found that one sheep. We talk about a man, the woman then that had lost coins. Right? She had ten coins. Could only find nine. We talk about then he says, look, he, what woman? Then she, She's going to shine a light under the table. She's going to sweep and garnish the entire house. I wonder if she was a bad housekeeper. Probably not. We'll, th we'll think about it. But she's going to switch. She's going to cover it. You've searched for something that was lost and said, she's going to find that one coin. She's going to go tell everybody about finding that one coin. And then we, obviously, what we call the prodigal or the lost son. About the younger son who went to his dad and said, Dad, give me what I want. Give me what's mine. Don't hold it from me. Give it to me. I want it. And how he would divide his living and give it to his son. How his son then would go into a far country. How he would waste that living, waste it with riotous things, to the point where he was there and he found himself in want. He was hungry. Didn't blame anyone. Instead, he tried to find a job. And he found a job and he joined himself to someone of that land. And his job was to feed the livestock. He reached a point where his, hungry, his hunger was so deep, so in depth. That, that, that he fain, it says there in the scriptures, would have eaten of the husk that he was feeding the swine. He came to himself. Verse 17, I believe, is about where we are now in Luke 15. And he thought, my father's hired servants have it better than this. He says, as a matter of fact, don't you listen to this, in my father's house there, he has bread and enough to spare. I'll go home. When I go home, I'm going to say, Father, I've sinned before God. I've sinned before you. It's not worth being called your son. Just make me to be one of your hired servants. But what he finds is a father that's looking for him. And runs and meets him and falls about his neck. And he says, kill the fatted calf. Bring me the robe of honor. Bring me the ring. Bring me shoes for his feet. My son was dead and he's alive. He was lost and now he's found. And so we teach Luke 15 about the lost. Can you glean that from Luke 15? Yeah. Matter of fact, Luke 15, when you hear that, you no, know, somebody said once, they said, Coach, what's the worst four-letter word in all of the English language? I said, I know this answer. And they were guessing what curse word that I was going to say. That's what the kids were thinking. I said, I really know this answer, y'all. And they said, seriously, Coach? I said, yes. It's lost. I said, not only is it the worst four-letter word in the English language, it's the most frightening and worst word in all of English language. They said worse than cancer. I said worse than cancer. They said worse than death. I said worse than death. I said to be lost. You ever been lost? I guess I'm fortunate. I've had a sense of direction. You get that when you crawl to a deer stand. You know before the sunlight comes up. When you're just a young boy. I had a good sense of direction. I won't say that I always enjoyed being in there before daybreak. Well, yes, I did. Even when it was cold and the squirrels were on the limb on the other side of the tree. Made you want to shoot them sometimes, but I didn't. 
But I can remember one time, two times, three times, people be lost. This year, deer season opens. Coach Rice calls me. He says, what are you doing? I said, well, I'm sitting at home. It's 8 o'clock at night. What, what do you mean, what am I doing? He says, we got to go here. I'm, I'm, get, get in your car. We're going to Beach Creek. Now, you don't know where Beach Creek is. Beach Creek is like the wilderness. You know, Wayne County's a big place. When you go to Beach Creek, you start hearing the banjos and the guitars. You're, you're, you're in a bad place. And, and, and so we go down there. I said, why are we going, Rick? I'm calling my cell phone. I said, why are we going down I said, you got to answer before we get out of cell phone service down here. He says, one of our, bo- our sinners lost. He said, he's going hunting. He's lost. And the look on his parents' face, stricken. It's a terrible word. Lost. What you learn from Luke 15 is that we can live in such a way as to be lost. Matthew 7, Christ says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. He said, For wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads unto destruction. He says, And many there be which go in there at. But straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads unto life everlasting, few there be that find it. We don't necessarily say that, say, Yeah, a lot more people are going to be lost and are going to be found. It just simply shows us what? our responsibility in either what gate we're going to choose to enter in that we can live in such a way as to be lost. We could actually be lost. But then you also learn about the value of something that is lost. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have a hundred sheep, but you'd leave 99 to get that one. And you'd celebrate that one. And you would rejoice that one. With nine coins, man, you'd be diligent if you had just to look for one. You would stick those somewhere and just to look for one, you would sweep the whole house. You would search high and low. And when you would get it, you would call your neighbor and say, I found the coin. Do I even have to emphasize a son coming home? A child? You would do the same thing that father did. He would fall about his neck. He would celebrate his return. You would make such great celebration. It makes sense. You know what the value of what's lost is? The perfect son of God's life. The shame of Calvary. leaving all the glory of heaven becoming common, spat upon, rejected, despised. To stumble beneath a load so heavy to bear, to drink of a cup where even his own father would have to turn away from him because what he bore was so opposite of who God is. That's the value of something lost. But you know, in Luke 15, Christ is trying to get the, get, the, get the Pharisees there who were always trying to get him, weren't they? <laughs> always. They were always trying to get him. Matter of fact, when you think about the things that try to get him, in Luke 23 and 21, it's going to be these same people. They're screaming, crucify him, crucify him. But you go back and you read Mark 2. You know, when he's going in Mark 2 and his, his apostles and they're, taking of the grains of the field. You remember that? And they're saying, oh, he breaks the law, he works on the Sabbath. You know, even sometimes people question, sometimes we even get hung in that, we think, well, you know, boy, Christ, he really did. He broke that law. He broke, no, he didn't. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 said he was tempted in every point as you and I have been tempted, yet remained without what? Remained without sin. He was perfect. They said, look, he's come to destroy the law. But he told them in Matthew Five, in the great sermon on the mount, the horns of Hatton, what did he say? Think not, I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. I've come to do what? To fulfill them. He says, as a matter of fact, not one jot nor one tittle shall pass away till all is fulfilled. Galatians 3, 24 teaches us that what? The old law was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, right? So it's to do it. So, so it wasn't, they try to keep 
And then here they get him. They say, look at him. He eats with publicans and sinners. Man, let me supplant the apostle Paul here. If I could tell him, I'd say, wait a minute, Paul, you're not the chief. I'm the chiefest of sinners. I'm so glad my Savior came to die for sinners. Because I am one. He's telling me, he's saying, wait a minute. You use them. Matter of fact, you go on here and you look in Luke 18. He gives them the parable of the, of the publican. You remember who prayed? Smote himself on the breast in verse 9 through 14. He smote himself on the breast. He said, why? Well, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the other, the Pharisee, he was doing what? Thank you, Lord, I'm not like him. Thank you, I am so good. And you know, Christ is pointing out to them, he's saying, which prayer is more acceptable? He said, I'll tell you, the one who was humble. And then when you back up and you look at Luke 16 and the parable of the unjust steward, and he's trying to tell them, look, self-justification is not going to get you anywhere. And it's in the midst of this that he gives them Luke 15, trying to get them to see how important lost people are. And he gives them this parable. Now, what we've learned, and what you get from this parable, other than the things I've said, is that you can walk away from God. But you can walk with God. Genesis chapter 5 tells a beautiful story. Short epitaph of a man. Could you imagine this? You ever been out and you looked at a cemetery and you've seen all the epitaphs that are on, uh, uh, on graves, on tombstones? Can you imagine if you had just had the epitaph of Enoch? What do you know about Enoch? Somebody say, who's Enoch? You can ask my son. What do you know about Enoch? He said, he walked with God. He didn't die. He was translated. He walked with God. So the possibility is to do what? To walk with God. But we spend a lot of our lives walking away from God. We really do. I mean, you just take the example of the three things that have been lost here. You know what? A lot of people say, well, look, they can't help but be lost. They couldn't help but be lost. You know, so what we say in our day and time is <laughs> they were born that way. Now, that excuses us. We can say, all right, they were born that way. Man, bad seed, born that way. To pray from the beginning, didn't have a chance, born that way. Bad seed, born that way. I mean, after all, you know, it is a tendency of the sheep to do what? To wander. That's why Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, Timothy, you preach the word, buddy. You be instant in season and out of season, Timothy. You tell them the truth all the time. You put them in the remembrance of these things, Timothy. You let them know. Because sheep tend to wander, Timothy. We don't want them to be lost. The coin? Well, man, that wasn't even the coin's fault. It's an inanimate object. It was the woman's fault. Man, you know, Adam tried that, didn't he? Whoops. It was the woman that you gave me. She was tempted and she did eat. It's her fault. Now, can evil com communications or evil companions corrupt good manners or morals, depending on how you want to, how you want to interpret 1 Corinthians 15, 33? Yes. But let me tell you what. I love it when people say, yeah, it's his fault I'm lost. I say, well, y'all are going to be there together. I mean, you're still lost either way. It doesn't really matter if you're lost, you're lost. It doesn't matter. But sometimes we say it's inanimate. It's somebody else's fault. You know, we live in a society sometimes where somebody just needs to, sometimes people just need to stand up and say, wait, wait a minute, my bad. That's my fault. Look, it's okay. It's not easy. It's the beginning of repentance. It's godly sorrow. It's where you turn around and you say, wait a minute, <laughs> That was my fault. I hear coaches do it all the time. I had a coach one time. He said that. We go all the time. We just this year, big game, a big point of the game. Quarterback changes a play. We had that. It was built in our check system. And as soon as he changed it, I squatted down. I thought, man, it's fixing to get hit. We, 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 it's not there. He thinks that they've, they've deceived him. Runs it. It gets smoked. Coach asks it's his son, he screams out there, and he says, what are you doing, Chad? I said, he didn't change that, I got that, that's my bad. He didn't need that option, my bad, don't, don't, don't get in. All right, don't get in. We're too many to be passing the bus. It is somebody else. And the son, I mean, if you, were, if you live with that daddy, wouldn't you have been lost too? I'd have left too, wouldn't you? I bet you he didn't get to have any fun. You know, we read things about Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Just think about all the good things he was missing out on lasciviousness and lust and 
immorality and adultery and envies and strifes and maliciousness. Those words just sound bad, don't they? They just sound like bad words. I mean, look, when you read Luke 15, the poor old older brother says, wait a minute, I've worked all the time, and you have never killed the fatted cat. I mean, let's be honest. We have a tyrannical father that actually makes a kid behave. He probably had chores to do. He couldn't play Xbox Live all day. He had something to do. I mean, it was straining. You know, look, come on, young people, work at it. My son's good with one thumb, one, one pitching stuff in the hamper, one thumb, one thumb still running up the right side over there. I'm mad. I don't know, but he does. He said, well, whatever, these bad guys. You know, sometimes we do that. We look at God and we say, God's holding back from me. He don't want me to have any fun. He's not giving me what I need. Now, every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, James 1 and 17. But we say, wait a minute, that's not what I want, God. And not only that, he expects me to walk in faith. I mean, my friends make fun of me. He expects me to walk in faith, and I have, I've lost my job. My health's bad, and he expects me to do this. He's a bad guy. We should run. Let's just be like the prodigal and go. You know something? Sometimes you don't realize what you've lost until you don't have it anymore. You were listening to a man here in Luke 15 with his head in the mire, down in the muck, and he says, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hired servants have got it better than this. Hired servants have it better than this. People on the payroll don't eat of the husk. People on the payroll aren't working out here barefooted. I perish in want. I perish in hunger. The slaves aren't going hungry. They've got it better than this. I've decided that young boy had to be a teenager. Y'all know so much more than the rest of us. We appreciate y'all letting us live in your world. We really do. We're so glad to have a part in it. We're thankful when you just skateboard by us after we get to the crosswalk where you can go around us. We don't want to fall off the curb, we old people. We don't want to slow you down. We're, we're grateful. You must have been a teenager, right? And you go, well, I'm going to do something. Here it is. Remember what I told you when you're running. This is why you're going to come to God. Because this young boy, look at verse 17. My father's house. There's bread enough and to spare. You come to God, you're going to get life enough and to spare. The thief comes to kill and to steal and to destroy. The Son of Man has come that they might have life and have it more abundantly, John 10 and 10. Now, some, some people just make that applicable to eternity. And certainly we know eternity is all kinds of abundance above what we can even imagine, isn't it? When we read the description of Revelation 20, could you imagine... Not just the, the wonders of, of the gates of pearl and, and the streets as if they were God. Can you imagine being in a place where there's not night, where there's no crying, where there's no death, there's no pain, there's no sorrow, where you don't bump into somebody that's had a bad day, that's going through a crisis. But it also means abundance here, friend. I'm telling you, it does. People really living life are living it in the sun. What did, what did, what did Solomon come to the conclusion? He said, living under the sun is what? 
vanity. <laughs> he said, look, I'm rich. It's vain. I worked hard. It's vain. I'm smart. It's vain. I have had all kinds of pleasure. I have all kinds of power. It's vanity. But the conclusion of the matter is to fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole, W-H-O-L-E, of man. It's what makes man whole. You see, we have abundant life, abundant living. Now, you know this, don't you? You know when you have a purpose for living. Listen to what Paul, Paul writes, Philippians chapter 3. He says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. Are you hearing this? But this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, I press, I pursue literally the prize, the mark, the high calling of God. Now, what did Paul say there? He was living life. Why? Because he said, this one thing I do. One thing. Does that mean you can't be a parent? No. Does it mean you can't be a husband or a wife? No. Does it mean you can't work at a factory? No. Does it mean you can't be a farmer? No. Does it mean you can't teach school, coach ball, do all manners of things, play ball, all of these things? No. But the one thing that you do is what? You press towards the mark. You pursue it. It's life with purpose. It's life and enough to spare, friends. Really living. Being made alive. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. Being quickened. Look, in my Father's house, there's grace and mercy and forgiveness and love and enough to spare. The grace of God that bringeth forth salvation hath appeared unto all of us. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Now, it's interesting that we see that. We read things such as Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. We say, for by, by grace we are saved. You know, we're saved by grace through faith. Not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. We talk about that and we say, well, that means then that there, there's not any way you can merit salvation. And do you ever merit salvation? You don't. But then what we do read in Matthew 7, 13 and 14 is not everybody's going to be what? Going to be saved. So we start talking about this. How do you, how do you work this grace with, 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 with faith, and how do you work these works in here? Because, you know, by grace, we're justified, Romans 3, 24. Am I right? Isn't that in there? By faith, we're justified, Romans 5 and 1. Am I right? In James 2, we're justified by what? 23 and 24. By works. And everybody says, see, all that works against each other. No, it all works together. Noah was saved by what? Genesis 6 and 8. Grace. God commanded Noah to do something. Read it in Hebrews 11. By faith, there's the second one, Noah did what? Built an ark. If Noah doesn't build the ark, is he going to be spared? No. If he doesn't build it according to God's pattern, is he going to be spared? No. If Noah doesn't get in the ark, is he going to be spared? No. So Noah gets into the ark. His faith, he believed enough to do what? To work the works of building the ark, to get into the ark. Now, who shuts the door? God. Who saved Noah? God. And Noah. <laughs> and the ark, <laughs> right? You start saying, water separates them. You see, all those things work together. In my father's house, there's plenty of grace. You can be saved. There's plenty of grace. His grace has brought salvation to all. There's plenty of love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God sent in the son of the world not to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Plenty of, plenty, plenty of love. Plenty of mercy. His mercy, the psalmist writes, is everlasting. The hundred psalm. His mercy is everlasting. There is plenty of forgiveness. Don't tell me the building's going to fall in. Plenty of forgiveness for you. God can forgive you. There's, there's that and enough to spare. There's peace and enough to spare. Peace. Christ says, For moderation be made known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. It's in everything with prayer, supplication, thanksgiving. 
Make your request known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall guard your hearts and minds. Christ told me, he said, look, I'm going away, John 14, 27, and I leave you with peace. And the peace I leave you with isn't just what? It's not absence of conflict. It's what? Solitude during conflict. Everybody else is going to be going, what's happening? What's going on? But you're going to know the end of the score. And you're going to have peace. And help and enough to spare. I mean, who can succor us better in the things that we suffer? The one who suffered just like we did. In Hebrews 4, 15 and 16. And care and compassion and enough to care and enough to spare. When you're going to come and cast your burdens upon somebody, you can cast up upon the Lord, and He will exalt you in due time. And, and, and he, you can cast your cares upon Him because He cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7. Hope and enough to spare. You see, when you're Ephesians 2 and 12, you're the same place those Ephesians were, right? You know what that's talking about, the difference in Jew and Gentile. Stay with me, I'm about done. That's the difference in Jew and Gentile. Because, you know, Christ says what? He, I mean, Paul's telling them what? He said, now look, there was a time in verse 12 when you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, meaning you weren't what? You weren't Jews. He said, and you were without God, without hope in this present world. He said, but now you've been made what? Near. And how have you been made near? Because the middle of the wall of partition that exists between Jew and Gentile has been broken down. How was it broken down? He tells you right there. Via the cross. So now we've been reconciled unto God in one body, one body, the church, via the cross. That's what it says right there. You see, so that's where you were. So you were hopeless, but now you have what? Even on the darkest night, the dreary time of your life, there's hope and enough to spare. So you have it all. Because in his father's house, in his house, in our heavenly father's house, there is bread enough and to spare. That's why you run to him. Could you imagine having that offer? Could you imagine being that son in the muck and the mire? And thought, well, in my father's house, there's bread enough and to spare. But foot, I'm too proud to go home. I'm not listening to I told you so. I won't go back and give my brother, my older brother, I won't give him the, the, the good feeling of knowing that I failed. I'll just sit here and starve. I don't care if I die tomorrow. I'll just give up. I'm not doing it. Could you imagine doing that? Well, then don't leave here lost. Because you don't have to. You simply don't have to. Because in our Father's house, There's bread enough in despair. Don't leave here not being a Christian. Be moved by your faith. Because you are justified by faith. Romans 5 and 1. Without faith you can't please him. Hebrews 11 and 6. Faith is that confidence that we get from hearing God's word. Romans 10 and 17. It moves us to action. We're not just going to call ourselves. We're going to do something about it. We're going to change the way we live because God is long-suffering to us, not willing that any of us should perish, but that all shall come to repentance, 2 Peter 3 and 9, and commands it of us, Acts 17, 30 and 31. Have your sins washed away in baptism. Even the rankest of sinners, he called himself, the Apostle Paul, who killed Christians. He was stricken down on the road to Damascus. He said, Lord... What do I need to do? You know, Paul recognized right there. Saul of Tarsus recognized Christ as Lord, didn't he? He saw him. That's part of the qualification of being an apostle. Was he saved? Did Christ tell him what to do? 
He said, Paul, you go into the city. We'll send somebody. I'm going to send somebody. Who was that that he sent? Ananias. You remember that? And I said, now, Saul, why tarriest thou? Rise and be baptized, washing away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. You can be a Christian. If you're the prodigal, you can come home. We can help you. We encourage you to come while we're standing and while we're singing. And you've been to Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb?